Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly Mind of Bleep webinar. Um, today we're going to be joined by Dr. Anna Chisholm, who's going to talk to everyone about pain, constipation, nausea and vomiting, which are all very important topics that we're all going to encounter during um, our careers as doctors. Um, you can post questions in the, the comments on Facebook. And if you think of anything, you can just pose the questions as we go. We'll have a Q&A session afterwards. And then if any questions come up to your mind later on, just please feel free to message us on Facebook or on the Mindably website. Um, the session will be recorded and we will send out the link um, in the comment section. And also if you'd like to have access to the recorded material, please make sure you're registered at mindably.com slash webinar um, registration. So I'm going to post this link in the comments as well. So you can just use it to register later to get the access to the material. Um, and before we start, I would just like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, MDU. Uh, please don't forget to sort out your MDU foundation membership before you start shadowing because unless you have filled in a foundation application form, your student membership will cease to exist in the summer. And it is essential they have indemnity covered to, um, so make sure you check it out and sign up for the links, which I'm going to post in the comments section in a second as well. Um, and now with her, without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Anna to take us for the session. Thank you. So hi guys, I'm Anna Chisholm and I'm currently a Logan doctor working in Yorkshire and Humber area after finishing my F1, F2. And tonight I was hoping to do a webinar on pain, constipation and nausea and vomiting, which are all three very big topics. So we'll try and go through them one by one. Thanks to everyone who's joining us tonight because I appreciate there's lots going on, lots of big sporting events. So very pleased to have you all here. So... We'll start with pain, then move on to constipation before going through nausea and vomiting. We'll then move on to case study and a little bit of a quiz. And then if you have any questions, please do keep writing them in the comments and we can try and get them all answered at the end. Or alternatively, if anybody has any interesting cases about any patients that have been involved in their care, anything to do with pain, constipation or nausea and vomiting, please do let us know because it's great to share people's experiences, see what different healthcare professionals did in different situations and we can all learn from each other. So first up is pain and pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage and it's something that is really subjective so something that might be 10 out of 10 pain to one person might only be a two or three out of 10 pain to somebody else. For example, standing on a piece of Lego for one person might be the worst pain in the world, but for another person who might have experienced a lot more severe pain, they might think, what are you talking about? That didn't hurt at all. So pain is made up of different components, physical, social, spiritual, and psychological. And as a junior doctor, it's your job to find out what is causing the person's pain. And through a history, examination, investigation, you need to find out what the different aspects of a patient's pain is in order to be able to investigate it and manage it. For example, you might see a patient who has a really distended stomach and has a lot of ascites. And if they're complaining of abdominal pain, then you think, right, well, that's it. That's what's causing the pain. But it might be that they've got something else going on in the background that is contributing to their pain. The World Health Organization has came up with this step-by-step -step guide to help healthcare professionals manage pain. And the healthcare professional goes up as the patient's pain is getting more out of hand and it's not controlled, but it can also move back down the scale as a patient's pain becomes less severe or if they start to develop side effects. So we'll go through it one by one. Step one is what I like to think of as simple analgesia stuff that you can get over the counter, such as paracetamol, ibuprofen. And although people think, oh, you can get paracetamol, doesn't really have much effect, they really are the basis of pain management. Next, moving on to the next stage, we've got weak opioids, and that's codeine and tramadol. And you would take these on top of the simple analgesia that we're 
just talked about. And although it costs us weak opioids, for people who have never had opioids before, they can be very strong. Then the top of the ladder are strong opioids, and that's your morphines and your fentanyl, oxycodone. And these are very strong and can have a lot of side effects. And they're the top level analgesia on the WHO ladder. Just some other things to consider is that the oral route of painkillers is always best for a patient and it is something that people can use more in the community. However, it's not always appropriate to give analgesia via the oral route. For sometimes if people's feeling sick, or they've got bowel obstruction or they're nearing the end of their life, it's not possible to give oral medication and instead you've got to think of different routes whether that be a patch, whether it be subcontinuous or IV, anything to stop the patient being in pain. Another thing to consider is um, the use of NSAIDs. So they're your ibuprofens, and there's stuff that you know you can get over the counter. We have to be careful with these in elderly patients and in those patients who are taking steroids or on anticoagulants, because they can increase your risk of um, stomach ulcers and then that they can bleed. So the patients have to be monitored closely and often are on proton pump inhibitors at the same time. So just moving on, this screen shows us some dose conversions and that's, this is what you need when you're moving between different formulations of medication or different types of medication. This is a few of commonly used conversions that I've used in my own clinical practice, but there's lots of different conversions between many different medications and many different formulations. And we're gonna post the link to the Scottish National Guidelines on dose conversions in the chat, if that would be something people would be interested in. Additionally, if you are unsure as a junior doctor, it's always best to either check your local guidelines or get senior support if you need it, because these opioids can be very strong and you don't want to give anybody too much of certain medication. Another thing to point out is just that the dose of paracetamol in patients that are under 50 kilograms is reduced. So instead of having one gram four times a day, you can only have 500 milligrams four times a day. And that's especially important in people who might have lost a lot of weight recently or in elderly patients. Another thing to talk about is breakthrough pain. And breakthrough pain is um, pain that people might experience on top of their normal analgesia that they're taking. And so you would prescribe painkillers, what is called PRN. And that would be if a person was experiencing more pain at a certain time, they could be given extra painkillers on top of their normal background analgesia. So for breakthrough pain, you normally prescribe analgesia one sixth to one tenth of their total daytime dose. But if a person is, is requiring a lot of PRN medication in a day, it might be that their background medication needs increasing in order to combat this new pain. In patients that haven't got very good renal function, so often under EGFR 30, you would want to switch that medication from morphine to oxycodone or alphenyl because they're a little bit more kind to the kidneys. So moving on to side effects of opioids. And there's an awful lot of side effects and they can be quite common, especially when people first start taking strong um, analgesia. I've had patients in my own practice who have actually not wanted to take the medication that's been prescribed because the side effects are so severe. So I had a gentleman who was having awful hallucinations from morphine when he was in severe pain after getting his appendix taken out. And he actually said, I'd rather have the stomach pain than experience the hallucinations that he was having from the IV morphine. And that can be quite common. So constipation is something that we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's very common when taking opioids. Nausea and vomiting, again, is something that we'll talk about later. And that's often a side effect that happens when a person starts taking opioids initially. Sedation and drowsiness, and also a lot of other side effects, dry mouth, hallucination, excess sweating. And this is only a few, there's very other rare side effects that can happen. 
infrequently people can get opioid toxicity and this can be very scary as a junior doctor who's just starting out in the wards if you get an urgent call or a crash call from the nurses saying that something's happened and someone's um, had some some of the things someone's got opioid toxicity so these are the symptoms that often occur with opioid toxicity and the treatment for this is naloxone and it can be a hard balance given naloxone because you don't want your patient to be in pain and reverse all of the opioids effects but you also don't want them to have a reduced GCS and low respiratory rate. I think the main thing to hammer home here with opioid toxicity is it shouldn't be something that you manage as a junior doctor by yourself and it's something you really do need to get senior support early for. One reason that a patient might become might get, have toxicity is because of a decline in their renal function, meaning that the kidneys aren't excreting the morphine as quick as possible, and therefore it's building up in the system. And that's why it's becoming toxic. And as part of your A to E assessment, when you saw a patient who did have a reduced GCS, you would take a using these blood test to see how their renal function was doing. And that might be the source of the toxicity. At every stage of the hoop pain ladder, it mentions adjuvants. And these are other types of medications which aren't classically your opioids, your paracetamols, your ibuprofens, that can help in certain situations and relieve um, a patient's pain in specific situations. So some examples of which are on the slide now. I know when I first started out, I didn't think that some of these medications would have such a big effect that they do. But I've seen patients who have had liver metastases have steroids and their pain has been completely relieved so much so that they're not needing the large doses of morphine that they'd previously been needing. Similarly with bisphosphonates and bone pain. So we'll move on now to constipation. Constipation is a very common symptom for many people. And for a lot of people, it isn't something that they would necessarily have to come to hospital for. Something that can often be sorted out in the community and often doesn't even need medical attention, but is something that can be quite debilitating, especially if it's causing a lot of pain. In elderly patients can cause them to be a lot more confused. And is something that as a junior doctor, you can manage yourself and you can feel like you really have helped a patient if you can help solve their constipation. So some of the causes of constipation, it might be a change in diet because of an infection, it might be um, caused by new medication, some of the side effects of medication such as the opioids, and it might be because of a change in diet, just not eating quite right. And that's especially true when patients come into hospital and they get given hospital food, which isn't always the nicest and is often very different to food they're eating at home. So to help find out what's caused the constipation, as a junior doctor, you would try and take a history, try and find out if they've started any new medications recently and then try and do some investigations to see if there's anything else going on that might be influencing and causing the constipation. The mainstay for treatment for constipation is laxatives. And often doctors form a preference over which laxatives they think that works well. And I'm sure you'll all develop this in your own clinical practices. So softener laxatives, such as docusate sodium, and they make the stool softer, the work in the colon, and they take about six to eight hours to have an effect. There's then hydrating laxatives, and that's lactulose or Movicol, and they increase the water content of the stool, making it easier to pass. With the hydrating laxatives, the patient has to drink a lot of water themselves to help the laxatives work, really. They then have stimulant laxatives, such as Senna, Abides Codol, and they increase the contractions in the colon and try and push the stool out. There's also other types of laxatives, it's bulk forming lubricants, all of which can have an effect and help resolve constipation. 
One thing to consider is if you do have a patient in hospital who's prescribed a lot of laxatives and then they develop diarrhea, it might be that we've given them a little bit too many laxatives and they've gone too far the other way. And if so, you would have to reduce them down and try and get that balance just right with what's going on. Additionally, it might be that a patient needs laxatives while they're in hospital, while they're not as active as they normally are, not having the same diet, maybe not drinking as much. So they might need laxatives while they're in hospital, but when they get discharged, it might be that they don't need it any further. And this would be something that you would counsel the patient on when they're being discharged. Sometimes, however, having oral laxatives doesn't always work. And instead, the patient might need to have a PR examination and that's examination um, to see of the patient's back passage to see if there's any stool that is sort of stuck there. And they might need an enema or suppository to help move that along and clear their bowels out. Not the nicest topic. I'm sorry if anybody's eating their um, dinners. So moving on to our last topic, nausea and vomiting. There's many different causes of nausea and vomiting. And again, this might be due to the medication, such as the opioids when they're first starting out. It might be due to where a patient's malignancy is. If it's pressing on a certain kind of nerve or in a certain place, it might be just causing a little bit of discomfort. And it might also just be down to anxiety. So when I don't, I know when I feel really nervous myself, I feel start I feel a little bit sick and don't want to eat anything. And it, so there's many different causes for nausea and vomiting. So the different types of different, sorry, different reasons why antiemetics might be prescribed are on the screen, and the number one indicated antiemetics listed. And um, cytosine has an antihistamine, an anticholinergic mechanism of action. Haloperidol is centrally acting. On Danzatron, it's a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. And metoclobramide is a prokinetic. The same with analgesia. Um, if you can give the antiemetic orally, that is the best method of action, as this could be something that can be replicated in the community. However, if somebody is nauseated or vomiting, it isn't always appropriate to give them oral medication. Therefore, you might have to think of IV, subcut, just to try and get that antiemetic into them to try and make them feel a little bit better. Another thing is metoclopramide um, can't be given in Parkinson's disease as it blocks the dopamine receptor and it would worsen the symptoms of a patient who has Parkinson's disease. And these are just a few other examples of what antiemetics you might give in different situations. Although there is a first line antiemetic suggested for different scenarios, it might often be that the antiemetic doesn't work for that patient or the patient has an antiemetic which works well for them. And if so, there's not a hard and fast rule for which and the emetic needs to be used, and it can vary between patient to patient. If there's any um, doubt over which an emetic to give, you can always speak to a palliative care team, especially if the patient is nearing the end of the life. Palliative care teams aren't just there to support people who are dying, they are there to help with symptom management. And if there's a patient who you're just not getting on top of their nausea, not getting on top of the vomiting, it might be a quick chat to them and they may be able to help with the best way to move forward. So moving forward to our case study. Mr. M is a 78 year old man who was admitted to hospital with abdominal pain. Before he has any investigations, he's asking for analgesia and an antiemetic. And this is very common when you work in a and &E. Although patients are there to see nurses, there to see doctors, but more there to get themselves sorted, get their symptoms sorted out, and often don't want to speak to anybody until they've had something to help them a little bit. So what would you do and what you're going to prescribe them? I'll give you a minute or so to see what you think. And please do reply in the comments and we can have a bit of a discussion if possible.
Okay. Well, um, firstly, I think I would hope everybody would go and see the patient and try and take a history and examine them if possible. You would want to find out what analgesia or antiemetics they'd already had at home, because you can only give paracetamol every four hours. So if they've had that in the house, we can't be giving them that again. And you'd want to find out if they had any allergies or intolerances. So you don't want to be giving anybody an allergic reaction or making them more unwell from a medication that we can avoid giving. Then depending on what Mr. M has already had, you would then want to work up the who pain ladder. And since the cause of his nausea and vomiting at the moment is unknown, would want to give cyclazine. Um, cyclazine, cyclazine sorry, is 50 milligrams TDS, and that's all normally oral or IV. Um, however, if remember, if, any, if anybody's unsure what analgesia to give or any and what any emetics to get, get senior support early. So moving on. Mr. M has now been in hospital for a few days and has sadly been diagnosed with colon malignancy with bone metastases. What medication would you consider prescribing for his pain, his nausea and his constipation? And how would you decide what you were going to prescribe? I'll give you a few more minutes. So again, you would want to consider what Mr. M has already been prescribed, moving up the who pain ladder if necessary, and also providing and prescribing breakthrough analgesia in case he has any flare-ups of pain. For his bone metastases, you would also want to consider bisphosphonates. And you may want to get in contact with um, other members of the multidisciplinary team. So people like orthotics, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, may be able to help with equipment to help relieve pain. So if he's getting a lot of pain on walking, or if he's getting a lot of pain maybe in his feet, depending on where the bone metastases are, they may be able to give aids as a walking stick, a walking frame, or specialized shoes to help with the pain. And that might save being given medication and then have no unwanted side effects from medication. Occupational therapy would also be able to help with equipment around the house to help make things easier. With regards to the gentleman's nausea, it would again be cyclazine. But if the cyclazine hadn't been working for him over the last few days, you'd want to consider something else, maybe undanzatron, might be what helps Mr. M. And um, his constipation, it might be that this gentleman isn't somebody who gets constipation from his opioids. And if so, that is great. He might just want to put laxatives on the ERN. However, if Mr. M is somebody who's suffering from constipation, you'd want to think about maybe Senna, because Senna is normally the laxatives of choice when people have constipation from their opioids. Well, a team that is very helpful to help combat pain is the pain team. And they, it's normally the specialist nurses or anaesthetics trainees and consultants who can always help come and help and adjust people's pain medication to try and get that right balance for the patient so they can live a good quality of life. So unfortunately, Mr. M sadly subsequently deteriorates and can no longer take his oral medication. He's currently having morphine 30 milligrams orally BD's analgesia. So what route would you switch to? 
and what would you prescribe? I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. So because the gentleman can't have any oral medications anymore, we need to think of a different route. And it sounds like this gentleman is unfortunately reaching the end of his life. And therefore it wouldn't be appropriate to be given IV medication. Instead, you'd maybe think about subcut medication. And to calculate the dose of subcut, you need to think about what the gentleman's total daily intake of morphine is and that's 30 BD, so 60 total. And then you would divide it by two to find out the dose of morphine subcut to give over 24 hours. So the answer will be 30 milligrams with regular PRNs as needed. And then that background amount can be increased if needed to combat any new pain. If the nursing team or the family or the medical team thought the patient was in a lot of discomfort. Um, other forms that you could think of as maybe a patch, but it would really depend why the patient wasn't able to have oral medication anymore. Again, this can be very frightening when you're first starting out as a junior doctor and you think, well, what am I going to do with all these numbers? What do they all mean? And if you're in any doubt at all, we'll get senior support, discuss with the pharmacist, discuss with the palliative care team, pain teams, your senior colleagues, the consultants, they're the people who can help you and they've probably done this multiple times and you can learn from them to see which way to go. More so, if this patient was becoming more drowsy, sedated and they were getting a little bit too much painkillers, you would reduce the dose down and try and get that good balance between pain controlled and side effects. So we've now come to the end of the webinar. Is there any comments or questions that I can hopefully answer or Samsung or Sarah can also join in or has anybody got any comments or anything like that at all? Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so also thank you everyone for getting involved um, in the scenarios. There have been a lot of comments on the, on the chat. Um, but no one has asked questions so far. So I'm going to um, hand over to Samso in a second to lead a Q&A session. But before I do that, I just wanted to let everyone know that we're going to post a feedback form uh, later on. I'm going to post the link in the comment section and Anna's going to um, give everyone a QR code. Please make sure you fill in the feedback form to get the certificate for attending this session. And also um, just be very specific and that will help us um, that will help us improve the sessions and make sure you're getting the most out of the weekly webinars. And yeah, so just be as specific as possible. And I will now hand over to Samsung and Anna for the Q&A session. Um, so please uh, post any questions that you might have in the chat box, in the comment section. Thank you, Anna and Sarah. I think that was a really useful webinar. And please, everyone, feel free to ask some questions. So we've got one first from Evangeline. Um, so in the last question, Anna, why is subcut favoured over IV? Okay, so subcut is favoured over IV when people are reaching the ends of their life because um, putting a cannula in a patient can be quite painful and uncomfortable for a patient to have that little plastic tube in them. So the subcut needle is a lot smaller, a lot more discreet, and can often be placed in it somewhere that doesn't 
um, where a patient's not concerned by it. So instead of being in their wrist or at the elbow, it can be just tucked in over their shoulder and the patient doesn't know that it's there. It doesn't, it's very easily inserted. It doesn't cause much discomfort and can give slow release analgesia rather than um, having a bolus effect that the IV medication can have. Also for some people, um, their veins can often be quite damaged, especially if they've had a lot of chemotherapy over the years, different, like a lot of blood tests over the years. And sometimes it is quite hard to get a cannula into a person to give them IV medication. So then subcut just gives you another method to get some painkillers into somebody. You can also give other medications subcut and give um, anti-emetics and give medication to help secretions. And you can also give IV fluids by subcut if needs be. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's exactly right, like you mentioned. Um, another question, would you still use Senna in colon malignancy? Because in a colon malignancy, it may be obstructing. So I imagine mm -hmm. you use Senna as a simulant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, it is a very good question. And you would want to rule out bowel obstruction before you give Senna. If there was no bowel obstruction on the investigations, then you would be fine to use Senna. And I have seen it used in people with bowel cancer, yes. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, also, I would just add to that is, like you mentioned, exactly right. So, yeah, of course, you wouldn't want to give lax tips to someone with bowel cancer who's having obstruction. You may want to give some nausea or vomiting meds that might help them symptomatically. And then, yeah, you would manage them as appropriate. Um, another one, um, is it appropriate to use the who pain ladder to step up in, to step up in a sudden acute onset pain? So it can be, but if I'm completely honest, it just depends on the sudden acute pain and it's very patient specific. So if a normally very fit and well patient came in, hadn't taken any analgesia at all, you might be a bit reluctant to go straight in there with 10 milligrams of IV morphine for somebody who's completely opioid naive, hasn't had any painkillers. Whereas for somebody who is does take a lot of painkillers you might be more lenient to give them very strong painkillers so you would just work so yes I suppose you would just work up in acute pain and just see what the patient's like if the patient is crying out in pain I agree it might not be realistic to give them just the paracetamol you may have to combine with two things straight away but just all is very patient specific do you have anything to add to that Sam so um no I, I completely agree I mean for example, someone's got a headache, you know, you can always start with paracetamol, um, mm -hmm. add it with some codeine, that might help it. So like you said, everyone responds differently to painkillers and, you know, some work well than others. So like I said, it's very, hard to, to, yeah, it's very hard to give her just one answer that fits yeah. everybody. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, another question, uh, um, how would you manage constipation in hypothyroidism? Hypo, sorry, was that a hyper? Yeah, hypo. Okay, so um, it would depend why the, what, the hypothyroidism is causing that constipation. Is that what we're thinking? Um, I assume so. Yeah. Um, if, that, if that is the case, we would want to replace their thyroid like with levothyroxine to try and get their bowels working again. Is that what we're thinking? Yeah, I, I would agree, actually. Um, yeah. Probably in that case, targeting the underlying problem, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the symptom, you know, of constipation, you can always give other meds. But if they're having hypothyroidism and it's unmanaged, then, yeah, like I said, yeah. that if, if it's a side effect of medication, it might be that you need to change the medication that they're taking for the hypothyroidism to combat that. Yeah, yeah, no, that, uh, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. it's always important to have a medicine reconciliation as well. Mm -hmm. Again, it might be something to do with that, definitely. And that's where the BNF comes in handy, doesn't it? Definitely. <laughs> I thought, although I think constipation is probably listed as a side effect for everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those ones, yeah. No, <laughs> um, so, oh, so uh, post-thyroidectomy on levothyroxine. 
was was uh, that the person has just um uh clarified that so okay if, yeah so if they're post thyroidectomy on levothyroxine and still having constipation i think that's uh okay mm -hmm. but i think i'd still probably start out with something like senna just because senna as a medication is quite easy to take so it's quite often people take it once on a night and it really does have a big effect so it's start off something gentle like that as a stimulant and um, i would also try and do some investigations and see if their level of thyroid function is correct and see if their levothyroxine is at the right dose because it might be something underlying that's causing the constipation. I would also try and just give them lifestyle advice, try and stay very hydrated, up and mobile, a lot of fiber in the diet. You don't want to give, be giving them too much medication that affects the levothyroxine and causes them more problems. Yeah, I'd completely 100% agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it will definitely depend on the individual. Um, the circumstances, particularly as they just had surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so there could be a multiple different things going on. So yeah, like you mentioned, I completely agree. Um, any other questions? Not for the minute. Not any other questions that I can see. Have you got anything else you wanted to add, Sam? So, or any, um, any, other, any cases you've been involved in that have been I, interesting? Um, yeah. I took my head. Um, I, in terms of like, I think you mentioned some key things. So things like paracetamol, which is very common, always think about the patient's weight and whether they're elderly. Uh, it's particularly if they're less than 50 kilograms, you, you'll have to reduce the dose. Uh, something like um, morphine, remember that in those with AKIs or severe mm -hmm. kidney disease, you really want to avoid because it can have more of a nephrotoxic effect than... Um, uh, oxycodone so oxycodone you can have oxycodone immediate release that you may want to give them with some breakthrough um, oxycodone uh, modified release uh, which which I think you mentioned anyway um, nausea vomiting drugs I mean a lot of these you'll have the BNF to use and you also get used to them so things like cyclazine 40 milligrams um, and the doses you, you become quite familiar with so I, I think I think you mentioned a lot of the key points so um, no, I, I think that that off the top of my head, those were those are some of the important things you mentioned. Right. Um, I think there are no further questions in the chat at the moment. Um, as I mentioned before, feel free to send us any questions you might have. Um, oh, we have another one that just popped up. Okay. So you might address this one and then uh, wrap up. Do you want to go for it, Samsung? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, exactly. So there's one more question. So what would you do if you add in Cody and mm -hmm. they um, say the next day that it made no difference? Okay. Or it worked for an hour or two, then wore off? Mm -hmm. So that's the question. All right, okay. So I think the first thing you would need to look at is the dosing of codeine. So you can have up to 240 milligrams a day of codeine, which is 60 milligrams four times a day. So if the patient is on the maximum dose of codeine and they're not getting any effect, then you would want to step up and move up the WHO ladder. However, if the patient's only taking smaller doses of codeine, whether that be 30 or if they were just having a PRN rather than regular, you would want to optimize the codeine taking before you moved up. So that's a good point to mention that um, PRN medication is great for breakthrough pain. But for a patient who has a constant background pain, it's better to take regular medication rather than just having it when the pain comes on. So I would want to optimize the coding, but if it wasn't working, would want to move up the pain ladder. Exactly. No, I think that's, that's exactly the right thing to do there. Perfect. Um, thank you, Anna and Samso for the session today. I think it was very informative and very useful for um, everyone who's about to depart in their career as an F1 um, and for doctors in general. Um, we're, going to, um, we're going to finish here. Uh, so make sure everyone has uh, time to get to where they need to get for football. Um, and please make sure you register for the MDU for the weekly webinars um, Join us next week uh, at a regular time, so 8 p.m. on a Wednesday, and make sure to sign up for the Tuesday sessions, the Finance Medic.
Um, thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice evening.